we visit Broadlands in just a couple of minutes, an Englishman's home. Broadlands, an Englishman's home. This programme was first shown in May 1984. first Viscount Palmerston bought Broadlands, he wrote that after he'd managed to remove the farmer out of the house and his stinking yard after him, he found that this place altogether pleases me above any place I know. It's famous as the home both of Prime Minister Palmerston and of Lord Mountbatten. Now his grandson, Lord Romsey, lives here and we began our tour at the East Front. At what stage did they add on this front part of the house? Well, this was the last of the additions which was executed by the second Viscount Palmerston, and he did it at about 1788. Uh, Henry Holland was the architect who was responsible, and what he actually did was he brought the dining room, enlarged the dining room that way and this way, took the, did the same with the north rooms which lie there, and then produced these four giant columns that you see around us closed off the roof and completed the job that had been started 20 years earlier by Capability Brown in the sculpture hall. It's a marvellous 18th century feel to this bit mm. here. Absolutely, and it, what it effectively did was to c close off a U-shaped Jacobean house. So the courtyard used to be there, ahead of us. Through here? Through there. Can we go and see yes, it? Yes, indeed. Thank you. This is the dome hall which was created by Henry Holland to house these statues. And then we come into the sculpture hall here. And in fact, this, where we are now, used to be the carriage front, and the carriages would draw up. And where we are standing is the front door. Shall we go in? Happy <laughs> to the original entrance hall. Well, here we are in the sculpture hall, which was created by Capability Brown on a commission from the second Viscount Palmerston. The purpose of it, as you can see, was to house his collection of Roman, Grecian and contemporary sculpture. He bought this collection, or at least the vast majority of it, on his grand tour in 1764. It's a fine collection. It's a particularly unique collection in that it represents, in microcosm, many different periods. For example, you have there the 3rd century AD Roman sarcophagus and there are a number of other important pieces too. Have you got a favourite? Well, by happy coincidence, we're standing next to the favourite. Yeah. Uh, this is a particularly beautiful piece. It's actually a copy by Joseph Nollikins, it was commissioned by Palmerston, of an original which is today, original by Michelangelo, which is in the Hermitage in Leningrad. And it tells a very, very sad story. It's called The Boy on the Dolphin. And it tells the story of a young boy who befriended a dolphin. One day they were playing in the sea, and the dolphin's fin gashed the boy in the side. You can actually see the, the wound and the blood coming out. And the dolphin gathered up the boy and carried him desperately to the shoreline. On arrival, the boy was dead, and so the dolphin tossed himself onto the beach and died as well. That's a terribly sad Awful. story. Awful. It's a real weeping. Oh. Now, that, that was the second Viscount. That's right. He was the, the father of the Prime Minister, Lord right, Palmerston. Yes. And Lord Palmerston also lived here, of course. Yes, indeed. What would it have been like in his day? Well, he made a lot of additions to the house, none of which, fortunately, are still standing, because he had very bad taste, and he produced a huge bachelor wing, which we can talk about when we go to the library later on. But you have a, recreated a room. Yes. Shall I go and show you that now? Yes, please. You call it the Palmerston room? Yes, we do. We've recreated it to show a, a study in the manner that Palmerston would have done in his period. 
and his period was very Victorian in appearance. What's the likelihood that he would have used this desk set? Oh, I think that's absolutely a certainty. This comes from, there's one or two of them in fact, one that uh, my aunt and uncle have in London, we have this one, from the Foreign Office, and from number 10 when he worked there. And he was one of those people, which is quite common in the period, who actually liked to work standing up. And I think it was perhaps because he was always a very fit and very athletic man. It's quite comfortable, actually. Yes, it is. And as you can see from the way I'm standing here, that he must have been quite a tall man, Lord Palmerston, too, because it's clearly been built and designed for somebody who is nearly six foot tall. He had a reputation for working very hard indeed. He had a reputation for putting a fantastic amount into his work, particularly his, the, the paperwork was le legendary, and we have a great deal of it actually downstairs in, in the basement. But he also had a reputation for being physically very fit. If you look over there, there's a superb painting by Henri Barrow of Palmerston on horseback in front of the House of Commons. And that's particularly uh, relevant because he would work his five days a week, and then on Friday afternoons he would get onto his horse or into his, uh, a horse-drawn carriage and would come down to Broadlands. Used to, a journey of 80 miles used to take about eight hours, between seven and eight hours. Very, very fit man. Yes, oh, incredibly fit. And of course, the other thing for which he was famous was for having endless love affairs. And if you look uh, opposite there, there's that superb painting of the great love of his life, Emily Lamb. She was sister of one Prime Minister and eventually became wife of uh, Lord Palmerston. She was Lord Melbourne's sister. She was Lord Melbourne's sister. She was married to Lord Cowper and they, she had, I think, four or five children. And the second one of those, William Cooper Temple, inherited Broadlands on Lord Palmerston's death. And we are quite certain, although it will never be possible to prove it, that in fact Lord Palmerston was his father. She lived, so the, the story goes, for a very long time on the Broadlands estate prior to them getting married. And he used to, he built a couple of towers on the house where she lived so that from the top of Broadlands he could look out and be certain that his love was there. He was a very romantic man, Lord He Palmerston. waited a long time to marry her. Yes, a long time. Lord Palmerston's busy life left him little time to make many changes at Broadlands, but his heirs have carried out quite a lot since his day. But presumably Palmerston didn't work in that room, you just recreated it. No. In fact, this is the room in which he worked, or more accurately, a very much shortened version of it, because when we took the um, wing down in 1954, we, the room was shortened. And it's also my study, my workroom, and, and my favourite room in the out house. Out of tradition? No, uh, out of choice. This used to be, when we took over in 1979, it was really rather a drab room, and we completely redecorated it. And come March each year, I really regret having to move all my papers and everything to the other end of the house, because I love this room. Because you open this part to the public? Yes, this is one of the rooms which is, in fact, open to the public. But difficult to judge that, to balance that, I should think. Uh, yes, well, you have no option. It's the only way we could get them through, actually, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Over the door there is uh, Sir Ernest Castle, who was my great-great-grandfather, uh, grandfather of Edwina Mountbatten. And he uh, was a great friend of George, of Edward VII who's over in that corner of the room. As you see, they almost looked alike. Yes, they enough. do look alike, don't they? And he earned a nickname, which we all think is very amusing, called Windsor Castle, because of his friendship and because he was responsible for the king's finances. And then in the center of the fire fireplace is, I think, uh, the finest painting in the house, and it's certainly my favorite, which is the Iron Forge by Joseph Wright of Derby. And I particularly like that because of the superb lighting effect that's been obtained by the slug of molten iron you see mm. in the middle, lighting the faces of all the other subjects. And that must be a wrench too, because that goes off to exhibitions. Sometimes. Yes, it does. We, we're probably now not going to send it so often in future, because it is actually available to the public for six months of the year. And then on the opposite side of the room there, there are three interesting paintings. You have look, two on either side of Lord Mountbatten by Carlos Sancho. Now, uh, each of those, one is uh, here on the portico at Broadlands, dressed as uh, Admiral of the Fleet. And the other, uh, in a sense, uh, for him, a more favorite painting is his wearing his uh, Colonel-in-Chief, Colonel of the Lifeguards uniform. Mm. And he was particularly fond of that uh, colonelcy because it was a unique honor for a naval man. Yes, and that, it's most unusual yes. to have the two. And then in the middle, 
that elongated cinemascope painting by Frank Salisbury of the uh, coronation of King George VI, in fact, was commissioned by Lord Mountbatten. And the way you can tell that, if you look to the right of the painting, second from right, you can see Lord Mountbatten riding. And if you look carefully, magically, Lord Harwood has reined in his horse at the appropriate moment <laughs> and has succeeded in exposing the full length of Lord Mountbatten on horseback. So they're out of line. So they're out of line, but he's in full view. Would you ever have wanted that sort of military career yourself, do you think? Not at the time when I had the option, but with hindsight, yes. I regret very much not having some sort of service background. Yes, that's interesting. Actually, the whole of your family's history is very interesting. You mentioned uh, Windsor Castle, who was Jewish. Yes, what indeed. an interesting, varied what, lot you all yes, were. What a bunch of mongrels, really. <laughs> Come and let us look at some more of our ancestors. Who is the first member of your family that you can trace? The first member was called Idolf, and he lived in Germany in the 5th and 6th century AD. Are you a Protestant by any chance? No, I'm not. I'm Jewish. Ah, what a pity. <laughs> no, seriously, he, Philip I, that portrait there is the first member of the family of whom we have a portrait, and he was the leading Protestant of his time. He was a prince who organized the revolt in Germany in the 16th century with Martin Luther against Catholic domination. And he, the name Protestant comes from the fact that he drafted the legal protest against the alteration in the Constitution which forbade them from practicing their religion. So a very important man in religious terms as far as this country is concerned. Absolutely. He was the father of Protestantism. Protestantism. What's that? Well, we're going to come to this in a few minutes. This is actually to change to another religion. This is Shamil's Quran. Well, no doubt you'll tell me. The, the whole of this staircase is very much full of pictures. Are they part of your family's history? Every single one of the pictures you see here has some connection with Lord Mountbatten's ancestry. They are the Germans, French, Russians, and it does, after all, represent only one half of the family. The other staircase on the other side has the other half of the family. <laughs> right up to Queen Victoria? Right up to Queen Victoria, who's at the top, yes. And the early pictures at the bottom here, who are they? Well, here, for example, we have Louis VIII, Landgrave of Hesse and Louis IX. Now, if you look carefully at them, amongst those two magnificent portraits with all their medals, you will notice that each has a peculiar lip. This was a, known as the Hessian lip and as a deformity that I'm delighted to say has long since <laughs> left the family. Even in one generation, you can see that. Yes, it? and if you go back yes. further, further down the staircase, you'll see more of them, too. Well, how lucky that it went out of the family. Well, otherwise I'd be talking like this, wouldn't I? <laughs> So the Hesses were the German side of the family? Yes, well now here we are come to the Russian connection. This is a lovely portrait of Tsar Alexander II. Now his brother-in-law was Prince Alexander of Hesse, who was a great warrior. Prince Alexander, in fact, accompanied his sister, who married the Tsarevich, he was then not the Tsar, and he then went, he was already in the Russian army, believe it or not, because this man's grandfather, Tsar Alexander I, had given him a christening present of a commission into the Chevalier Guards. So one year old baby already in the army. However, he came to Russia and he made a very successful career out of being a military man. The only problem was he fell in love with the absolutely beautiful lady-in-waiting of his sister, who was a mere countess called Julie Hauka. <laughs> they eloped. This did not meet with the approval of the Tsar, nor the Russian Grand Duke, so he was drummed out of the Russian army. And as a result of this morganatic marriage, he was no longer able to use his title. Eventually, the Tsarevich, this man, Alexander, persuaded the then Tsar, Nicholas, to grant the return of the necessary military rank, but he was not allowed to actually return to active service, so he had to go to the Austrians, and he spent the rest of his life in successful military service of the Austrian army. And the Countess, his wife, was first of all created the Countess of Battenberg. And then she was created Princess of Battenberg. And her, two, her eldest son, Prince Louis, was Lord Mountbatten's father. And that's how the Battenberg name came into the family. I think 
we forget how closely related the European families were at that mm. time? Well, they all, of course, intermarried continuously. Nothing much has changed over in Europe, actually. It's only in Britain that we have a better And you've got, you've got the military connections all the way up the stairs. Yes, indeed. This is a magnificent painting of one of Prince Alexander's campaigns. And in fact, here now is the connection with the, sh the Quran. <laughs> I wonder where if that you, was going If to you look at that painting, he is, in fact, driving Shamil and the, uh, his men out of the Caucasus. And on the battlefield, when he was walking around tending to the wounded, which he used to do, because he was very extremely concerned, always, was Prince Alexander, at the terrible suffering. He found some papers and a Quran. And this is the beautiful and beautifully preserved Quran of Shamil. It's hand-painted, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Isn't, isn't it superb? But if we go on now to the Oak Room, we will find a little bit more of the Russian connection in Alexander's uh, Coronation Book, which Lord Manbatten always used to say was one of the largest books in the world. So this is the book? Yes, this is the famous Coronation Book. We have three of them, in fact. Lovely colours. Marvellous, isn't it? This was the record that they gave to all the guests at the end of uh, the celebrations. The idea being that there's no, you know, there's no television, there's no radio. There weren't even proper newspapers in Russia. So they gave, as you said earlier on, a kind of older version of the Tatler, but everything hand-painted and coloured, and it weighs a ton too. Well, I did say that because it's so expensive to do oh, something horrific, like Horrific, yes. And all in French. All in French, which was the language of the Russian court at the time. And you keep it in this room, which is the In old this room, house. which is known as the Oak Room, because of the oak panelling, which comes from the days of the Jacobean period of the house, before Lord Palmerston bought it. And you see there a lovely wooden frieze in the style of Grinling Gibbons. This was commissioned by, the, uh, by Lord Palmerston. And you can see at the top the fowl, and at the bottom two fish, and around the frieze various items of fruit. And this was meant to represent the fruits of the Broadlands estate at the time. So this is the very oldest part of the house? But very also, you'll be surprised, but this is the most modern room in the house. Watch this. It's a cinema. Yes. Well, Lord Mountbatten went to Hollywood on his honeymoon. There he met various Hollywood dignitaries and luminaries, and he fell in love with the cinema. He actually made a short movie with uh, Charlie Chaplin. And ever since uh, he, uh, after the war, this was converted into a cinema, and we use it quite frequently to, to show films. So we very nearly lost him. Very nearly lost him. In fact, Sam Goldwyn, in the 30s, when he was a signals officer in the Navy, got him to go back to Hollywood and offered him the job of setting up the MGM sound studio when they first went to sound. And he didn't accept? He didn't accept. <laughs> History would have changed. We're very glad. <laughs> Full of surprises. Well, we've got one more surprise. Watch this. <laughs> What's through there? Giant priest hole, isn't it? <laughs> a bedroom where everybody's carried after they finish their <laughs> movies. Is it still used as a bedroom? Oh yes, this is the principal uh, guest room, which we use obviously only in the winter because in the summer the visitors come through here. But whoever comes to stay, this is the first choice and it's a perfectly lovely room too. Looks a very comfortable room. Very comfortable, yes. I've managed now to sleep in most of the rooms in, in the house. And this actually, funnily enough, my wife and I slept in this when we returned from our honeymoon for a few weeks because our rooms were being done. It's lovely to four post a bed. What's this? It's sil silhouettes? Yes, it's a, a silhouette vase. It was made to commemorate the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977. And it's an amusing idea. But you know, what's fascinating, nothing is new. Come and have a look at the uh, chintz over here. Not easy to find. There we go, Queen Victoria. Oh, that, that's, that's not a new idea at all. No, it's not. And it, presumably it existed even before this. But this particular chintz was woven for the Royal Yacht Victoria and Albert in the, in the 19th century. And there's century. Albert there as well? Yes, there's Albert. It's fun, isn't it? It's interesting that they should have Victoria and Albert in a place that Palmerston owned, and obviously they didn't get on at all. No, they didn't. But, I mean, that's one period in history when the house perhaps was not in favour in that sense. Not in the royal family, anyway. What a view out of the window. Beautiful, isn't it? Lovely. Lovely. In the morning, too. Thick mist rolls off that, that area, and it really is like a painting when you get up. Do you use 
system at all. Yes, indeed. Once the public leave in the end of the summer, this becomes our main dining room. And, well, in fact, it's laid for dinner tonight. You're going to eat here tonight? Yes, indeed. Just a little small dinner party or medium-sized dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely yellow on the walls. Very dramatic as you come in. Yes, we decorated, I think it was uh, last winter, we, we came around to doing this room. It was pretty, it had become pretty drab. And in consultation with uh, my wife, David Hicks, my uncle, chose to this rather dramatic yellow. The interesting thing, you see the beautiful ceiling up there. If you look down at the carpet, we had a special carpet woven in Brussels weave to reflect the motif in the ceiling. So that, oh, I see, yes, it does, doesn't it? The gold and the white. Lovely, isn't it? Yes. And the room is totally dominated by these four huge Van Dykes. Yes, uh, they were bought by Sir Ernest Castle at the turn of the century. They were actually bought from America, interestingly enough, back into England, which is a reverse uh, Indeed, art drain. Yes, that's King Charles, and the interesting thing about Van Dyke's work in general, and King Charles in particular, is they're all life-size figures. So you can see how short Charles I was. Oh yes, I mean, have he's you tiny. measured it? Well, yes, he's about, to, uh, I get it, about that high, probably. Really? Little short little man. Yeah. <laughs> and then over here we have the other superb uh, Van Dyke. This is known as the Darnley Van Dyke from the family from which it eventually came. And there are two Stuarts, Lord John and Lord Bernard. And the main th interesting thing about them is they both tragically were killed in the Civil War. One very quite close to here, Cheriton Heath, and one at Routon. Oh yes, and you can see by the dates that yes. they were very young when they died. And the picture over the, the, the sideboard there looks as, as though it's a bit wrong. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, it's, it's three pictures in one. Oh, is it? Uh, at first, it was a flower floral tribute by Jean-Baptiste Monnoyer, and it was, uh, Palmerston didn't really like it, so his great friend, Sir Joshua Reynolds, rather bravely painted in the centre what is known as an eye of sagacity, which uh, I think Palmerston felt he couldn't, having asked him to paint it, he couldn't very well ask him then to do something else. When he was dead, when Reynolds was dead, uh, Sir Thomas Lawrence, painted that rather attractive uh, picture of Emma Hamilton, as Bacanti, in fact. <laughs> and uh, Emma Hamilton was, of course, the wife of, of one of uh, Palmerston's great friends, Sir William Hamilton. Mm. Yes, indeed, they met in Italy, didn't Absolutely, they? Absolutely, yes, and when he was on his tour. Yes, and the whole thing sits very well over, over the sideboard there. Yes, the sideboard is an interesting example of the fact that most of the ground floor furniture in this house was made to stand in exactly the place that it stands today. Very, very little of the furniture. The pier tables, for example, those two pier tables over there were made uh, to, to, to stand where they do today. How lovely to be able to design stone and wood all to match. Mm -hmm. That's done by Inson Mayhew. And grills across the radiators. Yes, there? they're more modern, actually. They come from uh, my late grandmother's house in London, Brook House, mm -hmm. Park Lane. And they were done by Rex Whistler. It's one of the few things in the house we have from, from Brook House. Yes. One of the rather amusing sidelines for Lord Mountbatten was that shortly after the war, conscious of the fact that labour costs were ever rising, he was looking for various economies. And he had the brilliant idea of going around all the beautiful 17th century clocks, taking out the old clockwork and inserting modern electric oh, movements. Oh, goodness me. Which needed no maintenance. And funnily enough, when we... Um, uh, he had the good sense to not to throw these clockworks away, but to keep them. <laughs> and so when we inherited in 1979, we stumbled upon a crate full of ancient 17th century clockworks, <laughs> which was fortunate because all of the electric movements had long since seized up. And we, we've had a, one, a little man, in the last three years it's taken him, going around the house, renewing all the... Uh, ancient uh, clockworks. Matching them must, must have been quite a bit. Yes, business. and balancing them up again, but they now all do work. We had one left over, one clockwork and no case, and I got Garrods to design a case to go around the clockwork and gave it as a mm -hmm. present to my wife. There's another amusing example of Lord Mountbatten's love of, of mixing, I think, technology with beautiful old objects. Here is a superb Fabergé bell push. If you turn it over, you will see the word Ferranti underneath. Oh, yes, yes. The Ferranti company, to his instruction, put in a transmitter, a small ultra-frequency transmitter. And you can see a little microphone there. And this is a modern bell push, a modern version. You press, you press the bell, there, you could just hear it ringing. 
<laughs> if we stay here long enough, someone will come. Yes, well, we'd better run, hadn't we? <laughs> Shall we go before somebody finds us out? <laughs> This is in sharp contrast. Mm, this is the classic original uh, colour that was done. It's called the Wedgwood Room. It's uh, remarkable how fine the early Wedgwood is. Mm, oh, it's beautiful. The colours are all slightly different. The later Wedgwood, as you can see, gets a slightly lighter colour. It may well be that, that it age, ages and gets dark with age. During the war, this was one of the main hospital wards. And we get people coming and telling us how they spent the time here gazing at the ceiling. <laughs> there was three ply wood all the way around, including, believe it or not, the bookshelves with the books still in situ, yes. which is odd. But uh, what we have had to do here is to redecorate the room. We did it in 1979. And one of the things we did was to take some of the material from the curtains cutting the curtains down in order to beef up the uh, remaining silk damask that you see on the sofas and in the chairs because that material is totally irreplaceable. There is no way that we could get it woven again and therefore we had no option. Do you use this room now? Talk? Yes, where we're standing is actually there's normally a round table and we have tea here during the, uh, the closed season, obviously. And has that always been so? Did you? Oh yes, you since I was a child, I, I, I remember many tea parties here. I remember particularly that both my brother and I were very messy eaters, and my grandmother was extremely indulgent and allowed us to throw jam, goodness knows what else, <laughs> over all the covers, much, of course, to the quiet horror of my mother. The, there's a lovely painting there, which is one of Lord Mountbatten's favourites. She's Frances Theresa, nicknamed La Belle Stuart. And she actually is the face that uh, Charles II chose to go on his coins, therefore the prototype Britannia. Oh, and that's the picture. Oh, how lovely. And just beside it uh, is the medallion of your grandfather. Yes, that was done uh, a year before he was killed by Wedgwood. Uh, it's a great honour to be chosen. Uh, it was quite a, an amusing little story because normally they do two of those, one for their own records and one as a presentation to the Queen and uh, Lord Mountbatten in fact was given uh, a look, a look, it was intended at his copy and by chance the Queen was here and the idea was that the chairman of Wedgwood was going to give the large one to the Queen, she was going to take it away with her somehow and I don't know how it stayed here and another one had to be made at the factory and sent up to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> another example of Lord Mountbatten getting his way. Did you think that way about him as a child? What do you mean as somebody always had got his way? He always got his way except with his family. But they were away an awful lot. They were away a great deal, particularly my grandmother. And I mean, one of the sad things about the house is that for long periods in the 50s and of course after her death in 1960, there was no real woman here. And, and I think that, that if we've brought something to the house, it's that I'm married and, and therefore there is a woman living here again. And in, the, in those few years, well, 20 years, when he was alone here, did you get closer to him? Oh, uh, yes, definitely. I used to come down quite a lot, particularly since about 1970, the last 10 years of his life. So during that long period, there wasn't a woman living in the house? No. My mother used to come down a lot, and she took care of a lot of the female things, but it's not the same as living in the house. Anyway, shall we go and see my wife? Because she took over where? Well, when we came in 79, we got married here. It must be very difficult deciding how much to redecorate. Well, it's a matter of your available resources and which rooms are most in need of some form of redecoration. We basically try and do one room a year. And by that virtue, it's like the fourth road bridge. When we've finished, we'll start again. We've got so many rooms to decorate. <laughs> Come and meet my wife. Hello, darling. How do you do, Lady Ronson? How do you do? Nice to, to meet you. Down. Thank you. Your husband's been showing me some of the redecoration in the house, which you've been largely responsible for, I believe. Uh, well, I've tried very much in conjunction with uh, my husband's uncle. It's been a great help. David Hicks. That's right. You can imagine how daunting it is to look at a house like this and think, well, well where to begin? You've been very brave in some parts, and I must say, I think it comes off. The, the stark colours of the red and the yellow 
natural fluel, the, the modern carpets and... Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> most encouraging. Have you done this room then? We've started here. Uh, the carpet was a rather thread threadbare, plain, deep, pink area rug. And we spent a long time trying to decide what we ought to do. The idea we came up with, really, was that we ought to go back possibly to the idea of what would have been here originally, um, say, in the style of Moore, for example. And we then looked around and used the ceiling as inspiration for the carpet and worked to incorporate the design and the colours. And it does pick yes, up the, the gold leaf on the ceiling with the circle in the centre and the decoration around it, which was presumably the whole idea of it. Quite. And the colours that Angelica Kaufman's used in her panels, the red and the blue particularly. Do you remember the, the story of Aunt Pammy and the war? Ah, yes. My, my aunt was entertaining with my grandparents, the troops here, and she was showing them around the house, rather as we've shown you around the house. And she came into this room, in fact, Irvin Berlin was there, it was the day that he was playing. And she came into this room and she looked up, she couldn't think what to say about the drawing room, and then she saw the Angelica Kaufman uh, lozenges, and she thought, oh yes, oh, that would be interesting. She started to tell the story, and she couldn't remember the name, so she came and said, these magnificent lozenges are by Helena Rubinstein. <laughs> <laughs> the name sounded like, uh, as if it would fit. Uh, I think Berlin was staying here, and of course we've had a lot of entertainers here, we've had a lot of very famous actors. And Actresses. Absolutely. I mean, my uh, main memory of three particular people that we used to meet in childhood were, were uh, Malcolm Sargent, who was a marvellous character, and I remember him very well. Noel Coward, obviously, too, who was a close friend of the family. And um, the other person that I have very fond memories and have a treasured photograph of walking hand in hand on the lawn was Pandit Nehru, the Indian Prime Minister. And uh, there was a great friendship between both my grandparents and him. In fact, growing up as a child here must have been fun. It's, <laughs> it's a lovely house. It had its moments. <laughs> I remember there were some horrifying moments, though, at least not horrifying with hindsight. There was, a, there was a particularly beautiful piece of porcelain which had been in the family for a hundred odd years. In fact, uh, a rose bow and ewer which belonged to Marie Antoinette and had been given by Josephine Bohanois, a few days before she married Napoleon to Lady Rodney and then passed into our family. And I was about five or six, and I was playing around in the corner of this room, and I knocked this porcelain, which shattered into a thousand pieces. There was a large party of grown-ups in the room, and they all looked absolutely horrified. I couldn't understand what I'd done. <laughs> yeah, they were absolutely furious. Your grandmother didn't mind at all, didn't she? She didn't mind, it? no, but then she was totally non-material in every sense. I mean, she didn't care a hoot for material possessions. So the carpet is obviously brand new, but did you have to, for instance, put new plumbing in and that sort of thing? No, fortunately, although the plumbing here does leave a lot to be desired because my bedroom and bathroom are over this room and I have the most extraordinary bath with there aren't any taps and there's not a plug. Uh, there are a series of what look like taps in the wall, the same size, and you have to turn one to close the drains underneath. And it's very hard to tell when the water's just about an inch full. You, you can't tell whether it's still filling or it's turned on or turned off. And you just have to watch it go and know which way it's been turned. And the bath was being run and something happened, uh, distraction. Everybody forgot about it. And you see water pouring through the ceiling. <laughs> Onto the carpet, oh, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, no damage. New carpet and clean water. Well, and obviously, it's not too much. It used to happen, actually, <laughs> darling. If there's any consolation, it used to happen during my grandfather's time continually, and uh, nobody ever batted an eyelid. In fact, a very expensive and rather hideous device was bought, which was attached to the bath. And when the water reached the critical level, it let out an almighty shriek that could be heard all <laughs> around the house. <laughs> and we got rid of that. Funny enough, thinking of plumbing reminds me of another oh absolutely God. extraordinary story that I remember as being true. My aunt, again, Pammy, had a mongoose as a pet, taking over from my grandmother, who always had peculiar pets. And I can remember this thing, it was called Ricky Tikitavi, and it was about that long, rather like a sort of squirrel. 
And we do have extraordinary plumbing in this house with rather large waste pipes and things. This mongoose had a habit of getting into the plumbing, going down one plug hole. And one particularly distinguished visitor was half asleep in his bath one day with his feet up on the end. And up popped the mongoose out of the waste pipe and bit him. <laughs> and uh, he really did get a shot. Wonderful. Uh, whatever happened to him? Mongoose. Yes. Oh, I'm afraid some terrible, dreadful ending. I think it got, it, it yeah. got attacked by some creature outside. I must say Broadlands is in some of the most beautiful parkland that I've yet seen. Well, you must see the most sensational view, which we look at every morning. This way, please. Thank you. My bedroom. Please. With the river flowing down by the, by the edge of it. That's oh, yes. right. Normally, there are fish. salmon, trout, even the odd pike. Lord Mount Temple once saw a pike, grabbed a shotgun, and actually shot a pike in the water, which is almost unheard of. <laughs> Oh, it's wonderful, Ooh. isn't it? Isn't it yeah. glorious? The only sad thing is that this evening all the swans and duck appear to have gone. Mm. Do you come out here and enjoy this view very often? Oh, yes, in the summer we eat out here as much as possible. And as the sun I goes do down, it. all the bats which live above our head there come out and, and catch sweet. flies and whisk around in our hair, <gasps> which is lovely. Lovely. Quite frightening. <laughs> above our heads. <laughs> <laughs> And I wonder who stood on these steps, if you think of the history of the house. Quite. We've got the most wonderful photographs of Palmerston and his contemporaries seated and stood on the steps in the archives, really wearing their stovepipe hats. Mm. And this actually is where Lord Mountbatten and the Prince of Wales stood when they opened Broadlands in 1979. In this very spot. So. Oh, well, and of course, using it as a home as you do, presumably your children will grow up to, to this as well, hopefully. Indeed. If they survive the water, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what well, great worries. No, they learn. I mean, I have tremendous childhood memories here. For one thing, we always came at Christmas for about a week to ten days, and uh, often in the autumn. And I think and hope that our children will grow to love the place rapidly. Well, it's been lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. I'll leave you to this lovely parkland. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.